that's at the bottom of the cup. And so the water is beginning to warm and warm and warm. So that's the conduction part of this. But then there's a second neat thing that, that, that happens. If we put together two lessons we learned earlier, uh, one is called thermal expansion. Do you remember me saying when things get warmer, they got bigger? Uh, I even brought this brass rod out for two reasons here today. I was showing you this brass rod. I was showing you how I took the torch here. And as I warmed it up, the molecules went faster and, and faster and, and faster. And they got bigger. That, that is, the rod got longer. We called that thermal expansion. So these water molecules, as they warm up at the bottom of the cup, are expanding. That is, their density goes down. Do you remember what we just got done in the last chapter 12? We called it Archimedes principle. Remember we said that if something had a lower density than the liquid or the fluid that it's in, it would go up. And that's what's happening here. If you put together thermal expansion with Archimedes principle, this chunk of water near the bottom, as it expands, due to thermal expansion, is now going to have a density that is lower than the cool water in the rest of the cup. And because of that, it's going to rise. And so this goes up. And in the process of going up, cool water comes down and replaces it. And so what we get with this flame underneath it is a circulation or a movement of energy from the bottom to the top. And it just keeps doing this over and over again as this warms. It just keeps moving the energy and transfers the energy. This is referred to as convection. Convection is a little different than conduction. Remember I said let me point out, very important here about conduction. Conduction, if we come back to this original picture, I was saying, note that the atoms of aluminum never went over to here. Convection is a little different. Convection, you actually have a movement to the fluid. These warm, high molecules move the energy up to the top because the molecules themselves actually move to the top. They, they don't just bump into each other, they actually move. And so if I were to put this in words here, I would say convection is really this, that your thermal energy is then being transported or transferred by the actual movement and I'll just say of the fluid. They, 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 they actually move and that's the important difference of what convection is versus conduction. So in this case this little example that I have going right now, and we'll see how close we are to boiling. Oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're right there. Perfect. This is going to start going crazy here in a second. Is that I have conduction. That's true. At the same time, I have convection. And the convection is real important because as it moves around and it stirs, the whole thing is basically absorbing all the energy and that's why for these last five minutes I've been talking and even though I have a flame on my piece of paper cup it is not burning the paper cup the paper cup has not reached a temperature of 451 the combination of the conduction and the convection has kept it that way and of course as you know 
the boiling temperature of water is 212. So as long as I have water in the cup, I know it's not above 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which isn't even close to 451. And so I think I'm there now. I come over here and take a look at it. And it's, yeah, it's boiling. Maybe I lifted it up too high because it's not that much of a rapid boil. And I don't think it's going to get uh, any more than that with the way I have this up high. And it's too warm for me to lower down. So I'll just leave it the, the way it is. But it is boiling. And it will, like I said, stay this way until all the water's gone, of course. And so now we're back to before the break where, okay, how long is it going to take before it all boils away? And as you saw, it, it, it takes quite a while. Uh, this is nearly as much as water as we had before. But th this is still probably, you know, a third of the water we had before. And so it it'll take a while, but eventually it'll all boil away. And once all the water boils away, then it's going to be very easy for the paper to get well above 212, way up to 451, easily catch on fire and then the paper would burn. But this is my way of kind of introducing what is con convection. Um, and in fact, a real good example of convection is actually just your simple water heater. Uh, all of you probably, you know, have a water heater. If you live in a house, it's maybe in the garage or out back in its own little cabinet there, or maybe, uh, if you're in an apartment, the water heater might be uh, a shared unit or certainly might be hidden away somewhere you don't see it. But a water heater, of course, is this designed to make the hot water so that when you take your shower or do your dishes, you will, you will have hot water. But it's got a very clever design and a very simple design. And that's what I really like about water heaters is, first of all, if you have this giant container filled with water and you want efficiently to warm it up, where do you put the flame? Well, I hope you're seeing with this convection, the best place to put the flame is at the bottom. Because if you then warm these molecules at the bottom, they will rise and they will start circulating on its own. You don't have to have a water pump to circulate it. It circulates on its own. That's what happened to here. And it then circulates and gets the same temperature. By the way, I'm sure many of you have heard the phrase that hot air or hot water rises. And, and it's true. But hopefully you caught, and I guess I erased it, it is a physics process that is a balance between um, thermal expansion and Archimedes principle. When you take those two together, you will get hot air rising. In fact, today is a real, probably a really good example. If it's hot in your house or apartment, and if you stood on the table or you stood on a stepladder, you know, maybe a light bulb burns out or maybe you decide to dust the ceiling, the, the ceiling fan for the first time in a long time and you get up on a ladder and you get up to the top, you will notice it is really hot up there. And you go, well, why? Well, because hot air rises. Okay, well, why does hot air rise? And that's what I'm trying to say. And the same thing happens here in your, your water heater. In this water heater, at first, while you have the flame, it's circulating around. So where then, after maybe the flame goes off, or even if it's still on, just keeping it warm, the hottest water is going to be at the top, just like in this room. The hottest is up there. That's why when I go to change a light and I get up there, I go, ooh, that's, that, that, that's really hot. Uh, that's why, for me, on hot days like this, well, when I go home and then maybe I'm just relaxing, instead of sitting on the couch, I actually sit on the floor. And so I'll slide off the couch, I'll sit on the floor, and I can look at the TV. Besides that, the floor is tile, so it conducts the heat away, but I'm also lower, and so the lower I get, the cooler. And that's what I'm trying to point out with this water heater. In fact, you see the same thing when the engineers design a refrigerator. 
the, some of the best refrigerators that are the most efficient are the ones that have the refrigerator down at the bottom, the drawer, because where is it going to be the coldest? And it's easier to keep the bottom cold. The grocery store takes advantage of that. When I walk through the grocery store and I go through the frozen foods or just the, the, the cold meats and I'm walking down and I'm looking for some chicken, they will have a container that has the, the meat down inside and it's cold. And then they cool that air and the cold air then sinks and stays down at the bottom. And so even though it's open at the top, I can be in the store where it's not cold, but the meat can be in a place that is still cold. And so then if I decide, oh, I'll take that one, I, I, I reach down to grab it, I can, I can feel how cold it is down in there. And so it's this convection that they're taking a, a, advantage of. Now, the water heater, of course, is the reverse of this, and so the design goes beyond just putting a flame at the bottom. It's, it's pretty neat here. What they'll do is take water right at the top. This is the water that is going to go to your sink or your dishwasher or your shower. This is where the hottest water is. Now, as you start to use water, you have to replace that and so the cold water comes in and inside the water heater so if you look at the outside you don't see this but it's a neat design there is a pipe that goes all the way down and so when the new cool water comes in where does it go at the bottom it doesn't come in at the top. If it came in at the top, it would start mixing with the hot water, kind of make it lukewarm, and then that's what would go to your shower. That's not how it works. It works with a perfect design that as you are siphoning off hot water off the top, the cold water is filling up in the bottom, and so you always have hot water going out, even as cold water is coming in. Now, of course, this can only go for so long. As I was mentioning before, I, mine just broke, so I had to get a new one, and it's 50 gallons. So if I use more than 50 gallons of hot water, eventually this bit of cold water is going to get here, and then hopefully the flame has made it a little bit warmer by the, by the time it gets there. But that's the brilliance of the design. In fact, I had a friend who was a little careless. If you know a little bit about plumbing, a lot of these pieces are put together with copper and you, you uh, solder them together. Uh, we like to use the word, we sweat them together and you got to take the, the, the burner and this, this is actually what this is for. This is the burner and so you, 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 you take it and you put it on the pipe and you warm it up. But if you do that on the cold water pipe, you can get yourself into troubles. And my friend did get himself into trouble because the way the engineers have built this to come down and drop the cold water into here is they also made right here in this intermediate part plastic. See, plastic has a poor conduction because if the whole piece was metal, then the hot water would conduct into the metal, the conduction would go up to the pipe, and you would lose heat, and that means you have to pay extra money to keep warming it up here. And so to make this more efficient, they'll put a little plastic piece in there. But if you don't realize that, you may try to then connect this top pipe on the outside and you heat it up and when you heat it up the heat goes down and it hits this plastic piece and it melts the plastic piece and so in his case he got it so hot that they, he melted that plastic piece inside and what ends up happening then is this whole thing falls down so it's no longer useful and then the cold water comes in and mixes right away and goes out to the hot water and so after he puts in this new water heater he goes to try his first shower and it's warm for about 30 seconds and then it gets cold again and then after further inspection and investigating taking it back to the store they said well you you melted the inside piece you're not supposed to put heat on it it melts that's why it's there and so lesson learned right and so expensive lesson learned but he broke his own water heater his own brand new water heater you know $800 mistake and so try it again so that being uh, said, you could also notice this. Watch this. 
Uh, my pitcher's kind of messy. Let me clean it up a little bit. So here's this pipe coming down. But I did want to point out, you can notice this in the shower. When you first turn on the hot water, you might adjust the hot and cold just right, and you go, okay, this is a good temperature for me. But if you're in the shower, even only five minutes, which maybe is a long shower, but if you're there for five minutes, you would have taken off a lot of the hot water on the top, but not all of it. You haven't used all 50 gallons. But the water that was in the middle of the tank is now going to your shower. And the water in the middle of the tank, when you started that shower, is a little bit cooler than the water at the top of the tank. And that's our convection. And because of that then, the hot water is not as hot as it was. And so when you started that shower five minutes ago, it was a nice balance. Now it's a little bit on the cool side. So for me, usually about, you know, three, four, five minutes into a shower, I find myself readjusting the hot. I turn up the hot a little bit and get a little more hot water because the hot water that's coming in isn't quite as hot. So I need more hot water to balance the, the cold water. And of course, if I'm in there for another five minutes, I find myself adjusting it yet again because now I'm getting water down here. Eventually, if I'm in there too long, it just is all cold water and there's nothing I can do with the hot water knob. I just, I, okay, the hot water's all gone. I got to get out and wait another 20 minutes before it gets, gets hot again for the next person to, to take their, their shower. But that's some really good examples of uh, co convection. Santa Barbara is a really good, and all of Southern California is a really good example of convection. And your, your author does a good job with a, with a picture here. And uh, let's see if I can find his convection ones. Here we go. Because in the summertime, particularly, we call it the sea breeze. Sometimes we call it the afternoon sea breeze. You, you see what happens for our weather pattern here in Santa Barbara is something like this. Uh, we have an ocean that is kind of cool, probably running about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we got the land of the city of Santa Barbara. Uh, then we got some mountains. The mountains turn into another valley, the San Ynez Valley. Then we got another range of mountains. But when the sun is up in the sky, so take the sun shining down, a very interesting effect can take place if you put together the specific heat and the convection. You see, as the sun shines on the ocean, you'd say, well, it begins to warm the ocean. Okay, true, it does warm the ocean. And so going back to the last lecture, Q equals to MC delta T. But remember the ocean is made out of water. Remember I said the specific heat of water is very high and of course the ocean has a lot of mass. So it's going to take a lot of energy to raise the temperature of the ocean. And that's why really the ocean doesn't warm up by much. All summer long. Uh, we're in June now. But by August and September, even though the sun has been shining on it every single day, it will warm up from 62 to 67. <laughs> it just doesn't warm up much over the summer. And that is really why the specific heat comes into play here, because water has a very, very high specific heat. And of course, the oceans are fluid, so you've got these convections going on, although the convections kind of uh, are not as useful because if you warm the top of the water, that, that's where it stays there. In fact, maybe you've even noticed that with a swimming pool. Another funny story, uh, kind, of the, kind of the same thing. Uh, but now this is when I was an adult and taking my kids and we were staying in a hotel and they saw a pool and they got all excited. Hey, can I go swimming, Dad? Uh, sure, but I got to thinking about it. It was cold. Nobody else is swimming in the pool. I'm not sure how warm that pool is. And they go, well, 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 please, Dad, we want to go swimming. Can we at least touch it? I said, well, let's go down. So as we're going down the little staircase out to the swimming pool, I got to thinking, you know what? Nobody's been in this pool. There's probably not heated or very little heated. And if it is, it's all on the top. 
And so I put my fingers in and my kids put my fingers in and it was decently warm. And they go, Dad, see, it's, it, it's warm. <laughs> and, and then I just had a smile. I was just like, okay, do you want to go swimming? Feel free. I'll just stand here on the deck and watch you. Just jump on in. <laughs> but in my mind, I'm going, I wonder how cold it is down there. And I got an answer to that. When they both jump in, drop down about six feet, and they pop up with their eyes so big, it's cold, it is really cold. And they come swimming back to the side and grab the deck and plop out and go, it is really cold, it's only warm at the top. And I go, yeah, go figure. <laughs> uh, of course, they really wanted to swim, so they continued for a while. They'd jump in and then hop out, and then jump in and, and hop out. So they still had a good time here, but that, again, is more of this convection. Well, back to our Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara then here, I want to emphasize the ocean it's not going to warm up much during the summer. However, that same sunshine is now shining down on the rocks and sand. And the specific heat of rock and sand is much lower. And so what I mean by that is, taking a given day, from about sunrise to noon, the rock and sand are going to warm up far more than the ocean. And so, if you imagine over here, the inland valley is now getting hot, but the ocean remaining cool. This air over the inland valleys is going to rise. That's our convection that I'm trying to talk about. Uh, should I let this keep going? It's only got about a quarter. I'll, I'll leave it keep going. So, notice it hasn't burned yet, but... There's still water, but by the time we're, we're done here, I don't think there'll be any water left. All right, so back to this. This would rise, and as it rises up, then the cool air is going to flow into its place. And that's why Santa Barbara has the afternoon breeze. And it's a cool afternoon breeze. Look at it is the rising of the hot air in the inland valleys <clears throat> that then, what I like to say, turn on mother's, uh, Mother Nature's air conditioning and then makes the air go across the cool ocean, so it's cool air, and then hits Santa Barbara. And you'll notice it doesn't really happen until the afternoon. I know on a typical summer day when I'm walking on campus, I might walk by the flags in front of the library in the morning and at 8 o'clock they are just, flags are just hanging down. 8 in the morning. But when I walk back that way at 3 in the afternoon, the flags are just ripping and the water, the wind is just ripping off the ocean and that's that sea breeze. And so every time I see those flags flying, particularly when I realize that the morning it wasn't flying the flags, and in the afternoon the wind is just ripping the sea breeze, this is what goes through my mind. Hey, we're lucky here in Santa Barbara. We have Mother Nature's air conditioning turning on. This cool sea breeze is keeping us cool. And the hot air over the valleys is what's rising. And that's why I called up this picture. That's exactly what the author is trying to show here as he's trying to say, hey, let's understand convection and some of the reasons it is important. He's showing here that over land, you're going to get a little warmer than over the water. And so what will happen is you will set up these natural convectional currents and it will then blow from the ocean onto land. And then, of course, the other direction up on, on top. And Santa Barbara's a good example because the reverse is also true. Let me change colors here. But for the same reason that the land warmed up faster than the ocean, at night, or maybe even not night, but late in the day before the sun sets, but near the evening time, so near sunset, with the sun low in the sky, the rock and sand cool much easier. Because again, there's less mass and there's a smaller specific heat. And so what happens now is exactly the reverse. The valleys become cool. 
cools the air and the air sinks. And as it sinks, it comes over the mountains and then into Santa Barbara and then out to sea. And so this strong wind that we had at 3 o'clock is usually, that sea breeze is usually gone about 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. In fact, that's some of the best times to be out on the beach walking or jogging along the beach or having a volleyball game because it's at that time in the, in the day the, the, the winds have diminished again. So it's either early in the morning or in the, in the evening. Of course, they can get really strong and blow really hard. And so that's why we have, in, in our area, um, a weather pattern which we call the sundowners. The sundowner winds. And they will blow really, really hard. Um, I don't often hear it, but I was pleased to hear it last night. I was watching Key News last, last night, the 6 o'clock news, and the uh, weather reporter, uh, she was talking along and she said, oh, the evening will cool down, and then just, she said this, she said, but not enough to give a sundowner winds, and blah, 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 and she went on. And I said, yeah, there's that word. You don't hear it much. And I actually turned to my wife and I said, did you... Do you hear her say sundowners? And she goes, uh, I, I, I guess so. I wasn't really paying attention. I go, you know what sundowners is? And she's like, oh, I think they say it once at a time. And so people don't really catch it. But Santa Barbara, Malibu, same kind of structure, is well known for these, these sundowners. And so we can get these heavy winds. In fact, one of the worst camping experiences I ever had was at the uh, Gaviota Coast. I was out camping at Gaviota Beach and the sundowners hit one time and Oh my goodness, I thought they were, I literally thought they were going to blow everything out to sea and out to the ocean. I mean, I could not sleep all night. It was just, whoosh, whoosh. finally died down though about 11 o'clock. So it wasn't really all night, but it was incredibly strong. And I'll even add to Santa Barbara's challenge is not so much this time of the year, but when this happens at the end of the summer, into the fall. And it can happen much stronger in the fall. The sundowners are much more predominant in the fall. Because it's fall, this will cool down and the winds will be stronger. So sundowners in fall are really dangerous because, number one, they're stronger winds. Number two, it's late fall, so everything is dried out. And so we're in fire danger. So we've got the winds, possibility of a fire. If a fire starts, the winds are actually blowing to the city. And it's from the mountains down to the, to the city. So we've had some really bad fires. The Painted Canyon fires is the one I'm thinking of back in 93. I mean, the burden light, what, 600 homes or something? That was in incredible. A um, few years back, uh, before the big Th Thomas fire even, I'm trying to think of the name of it, Castilla Springs one. It started near the Camarillo area. And this was Malibu. It went over the hills and the de sundowners just kept blowing it out to, to, to Malibu. In incredible. Uh, anyways, I better keep going so we can make sure we uh, finish this, this, this chapter. But that's what his other picture here is trying to show here, that this is then the, the reverse. And so in the reverse, the air sinks over the land and blows out to, to, to sea here. Well, I'll turn that off for just a minute. And one more thing before I leave the con convections. And I see my cup over here smoking. So I think we've finally... Yep, there it goes into a flame. I've boiled all the, all the water away here. And so finally, we have got the cup up above the uh, 451 and now have burnt it. And so now I can finally shut it off there and say, okay, all uh, has, has boiled out. But before I completely leave convection, I just want to point out that sometimes you will see electronic equipment and I brought one of our, our power supplies here and so maybe think of this as maybe a stereo amplifier or uh, people do that anymore now with our earbuds and cell phones but a high powered device on the back of it will often have what they call cooling fins or the device itself will have holes drilled in the side and the top and the bottom. This one doesn't have any in the bottom but it does have what we call the cooling fins on the back and it does have the air holes in the side and the top because the electronics inside will get hot. Uh, here's some cooling fins that I took off an old stereo. Here's the amplifier and uh, here's a... I think this was another amplifier. Um, but notice then that they are, uh, first of all, made out of aluminum. 
And second of all, they have these fins sticking out because here's the design of them. Uh, the engineers are thinking about convection. And so they've, lay, lay, uh, they've designed the fins, first of all, out of aluminum. So when they mount it here, the fins go in here. And so all the electronics in here gets hot and the aluminum conducts really well. And so the outside fins get really hot because of conduction. But then the air that is trapped between the fins starts to get warm and goes up. That's the convection. And so as it goes up, it'll bring in cool air. And so the air here will start circulating on convection. And so what's nice about this design is you don't have to build a cooling fan in your electronics. You let the convection currents and the conduction of the aluminum take advantage of it. That's why also why the holes are drilled in it. The hot air that's in this piece of electronics will go to the top. And if this was a solid piece, the hot air would get trapped up here. But by drilling the holes in the top, the hot air can rise out, drawing in cool air. So this little device does not have a cooling fan on there. Now, some devices do. Uh, most computers, desktop computers, have a cooling fan. So they just circulate it with the fan. But if things don't get quite that hot, you don't need to put in fancy electronics. You don't need to put in a cooling fan. You can let convections do it. And that's why your cooling fans will always be mounted in a vertical direction like this so that the hot air can can rise. Of course on a motorcycle the cooling fans, an air-cooled motorcycle, are mounted this way. But that's a little different story. They're mounted this way because the idea is that you'll be riding your motorcycle in a forward direction and that will make the wind blow through them taking the heat out. So any of your air cooled engines that move like a motorcycle, you do put the cooling fins this way. But that's also the danger of why you should never let a motorcycle sit and idle. Because if it idles, so it's running, but it's not moving, it doesn't cool itself really well. And it will overheat. And of course that's why the California Driving Code says that motorcycles are allowed to go between the traffic lanes because you can't take a motorcycle and stop in traffic. The motorcycle will overheat and break down. You've got to keep that motorcycle moving. So, of course, it says moving at a safe pace. So it's a little dangerous going through the cars, but you can do it. You can do it legally, and that's wh why, it's, why it's there. So the people on their motorcycles rushing through are not just inpatient drivers. They, they really are required to drive through to keep their engines running and, and going. Uh, I said one more, but I guess I, I, I lied here. There, there is this one here. Uh, this is a great one to show. You can really see the convection currents really well. Let me get some hot water here. And so I've got quite a bit of hot water here. Let me grab my uh, little towel here. Let me double it up because this water can get really hot. And as you hopefully noticed before I started pouring water in here, there was some red food coloring dye down at the bottom. Not much. Probably should have had more. Let's see how red it looks. But I'm hoping that for a visual effect to remind me. Oh, oh, actually that's good. That's nice and red. So that's the hot water. Let me get a second one so I can compare two things. And so I'm going to come over here. It's more hot water. And again, and I probably should have showed you, there was some red food coloring down at the bottom. And so this one too will be red in color. And that's just kind of a visual reminder that this is the hot water. And of course earlier on I filled up two, uh, I don't know if you can see, but they're, 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 they're cold water. And so let me try this. Let me put one of them right here and fill it all the way to the top with cold water. And this one let me fill all the way to the top with hot water. This one here, I'll worry about it next. 
Let me put it over here. Actually, well, I'll just get it ready. So let me take this one filled with cold water. And let me switch spots with this one. Okay. Because I want to put then and do a comparison to show you the difference that convection can really make. If I start with try that again just so hot if I start with hot water on top of cold water as opposed to the other way around cold water on top of hot water you see this whole idea of convection as I said earlier is really thermal expansion with Archimedes principle and when I compare these two I'm hoping you see how this one is quickly changing to a pink color because what's happening is the hot water is rising and mixing with the cold one and so the pink color is kind of my indication that this is starting to warm up up here and this